I'll chat for three or four hours. <laughs> we'll open up to some questions and comments. Look, I don't have to tell anybody here that we are living in a rather crazy moment in American history, is that right? Yeah. And every time you turn on the television, you say, that really can't be true, is it? Did the president really say that? And unfortunately, uh, it is true. So let me begin by saying the obvious. And that is, and I speak not just as a United States Senator, I speak not just as a presidential candidate, I speak as an American citizen, saying that it is beyond my comprehension, something that I never thought that I would see in my lifetime, that we have a president who is an overt racist, sexist, homophobe, and religious bigot. That I never thought. You know, regardless of one's political views, what presidents have historically understood is that when you get to the Oval Office, you try to bring people together. You try to bring people together, not divide them up based on the color of their skin or where they were born or their sexual orientation. by dividing us up. And we got some bad news for him. We are going to beat him and beat him bad because we're bringing our people together. And by our people, I mean the American people together around an agenda. Around an agenda that works for all of us not just the one percent. I want to begin by thanking the people of New Hampshire for the help they gave me four years ago. Well, I am personally thankful to you. What you did was more important than just vote for me. When I came to New Hampshire, I laid out an agenda that the establishment said was an extreme agenda, was a radical agenda, was an agenda that the American people would never support. Well, we came here to New Hampshire and the people of this state said, yep, that agenda makes sense to us. Thank you very much, New Hampshire. New Hampshire said is that if somebody works 40 hours a week, that worker should not be living in poverty. We've got to raise that minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. And when I came here to New Hampshire four years ago, that seemed to be a radical idea because we were more than doubling the federal minimum wage. But I want to tell you that since New Hampshire did its thing and other states came along, seven states in America have voted to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, and the U.S. House of Representatives has done the same. So it turns out, when the people speak and get involved in the political process, an idea that once seemed radical turns out not to be quite so radical. Four years ago I was here and I said, you know what? The world has changed, the economy has changed, technology has changed. And K through 12 education, free public education, was fine. 30, 40 years ago, but we have to expand that concept. 
If we want our kids to go out and make it into the middle class and get decent paying jobs. So I said four years ago, we got to make public colleges and universities tuition free.
the tens of millions who are uninsured or underinsured, not just the 30,000 who are dying, not just the working class people who are spending 20, 25 percent of their incomes on health care. What we are talking about unbelievably is that every year, last year, 500,000 Americans went bankrupt because they could not pay the outrageous cost of medical care in America. Now just think about it. Think about it for a moment. One thing, you want to go bankrupt, you do something stupid, you make a bad investment, too bad. But right now, a half a million people are going bankrupt because they ended up in a hospital with a serious illness, got a $100,000 bill for the hospital, they can't pay it off. People who get sick have enough to worry about in terms of getting back on their feet and getting well. You don't have to worry about financial ruin for your family. The function of the current health care system is very simple. It is to make as much in profit as it can for the health care industry, for the insurance companies, the drug companies, and other parts of the health care industry. And I want you all to hear this. Last year, the top 10 drug companies in America who are charging us by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs made $69 billion in profit. A couple of weeks ago, some of you may know, I went up to Windsor, Ontario with a number of folks from the Midwest who are diabetic. Diabetes is a growing serious problem in America. Seven and a half million people in this country need insulin to deal with their diabetes. We went from Detroit, Michigan to Windsor, Ontario, 15 minute ride and a bus. Anyone here know the differential in price in Windsor, Ontario for insulin compared to the United States? 10 to 1. We are paying 10 times more for the exact same product made by the exact same company. And it's not just it's not what I learned on that trip, I didn't know this. Seven and a half million people who are diabetic dealing with insulin, one quarter of them are rationing their insulin, which is an extremely dangerous thing to have to do. And while we were on that trip, there was a young man and his mother, the guy was a football player, big guy. And he had diabetes, he has diabetes, and he uses insulin. And a couple of years ago, he lied to his parents because they were already spending so much money on his diabetes. He lied, he said, yeah, I got all the insulin I need. He didn't. He was rationing it as a football player and his health deteriorated. That family saved $10,000 on that trip buying insulin in Canada. And again, it's not just insulin. It is prescription drug after prescription drug and it's not just Canada. Countries all over the world pay a fraction of the price of what we pay for prescription drugs because we are the only country, major country on earth, that allows the pharmaceutical industry to do anything they want and charge us any price they want. And we together are going to end that absurdity. Senior citizens 
65 or older called Medicare, created in 1965 by Linda Johnson in the Democratic Congress. Called Medicare happens to be the most popular health insurance program in the country. Is Medicare perfect? No, it is not. And one of its deficiencies is today, it does not cover dental care, which is a big deal for seniors who need dentures, and so it doesn't cover hearing aids, which are quite expensive, or eyeglasses. Under our Medicare for All plan, we cover dental care, eyeglasses, and hearing aids. How do we implement Medicare for All? Not complicated at all, very simple. Right now, people are in the program 65 or older. There are millions and millions of people who are today 58, 60, 62, who cannot wait until they get into Medicare because they have health care needs that they want addressed. What we do in the first year is lower the eligibility age for Medicare from 65 down to 55. Next year we go from 55 down to 45, then down to 35, and then we cover every man, woman, and child in this country. That is a lot less complicated than many of the other proposals out there, which in fact are very complicated. It's one of the problems of many that we have with our dysfunctional healthcare system. It's not just that we are spending twice as much per capita as other people in any other industrialized country, is that the system today is enormously bureaucratic and complicated. The half the people spend hour after hour arguing with the insurance companies, am I covered, am I not covered, why do you reject my claim? You got people who are PhDs who can't figure out what's in the policy. You thought you were covered, you turned out not to be covered. A good friend of mine has good health insurance. Turns out a procedure that he needed was not covered, $3,000 out of pocket. So what we are doing is ending the complexity. And that means no co-payments, no premiums, no deductibles, no out-of-pocket expenses. <laughs> Is it free? No, it's going to be paid for out of the tax base. Just was in Wolfsburg, we had a wonderful meeting in Wolfsburg a few hours ago, and a woman stood up and said, Bernie, she was in her 60s, I think, and she said, I am paying about $10,000 in premiums so that I got a $5,000 deductible. So when people ask me, how are you going to pay for it? We are already paying for it. We are spending twice as much per person on healthcare as we the people of any other country. Now my Republican friends tell me people hate taxes. I guess they think people love premiums. Oh boy. Oh, how thankful I am to pay $5,000 out of my own pocket to pay 10% copayment, 20% copayment. What our bill will do is lower the cost of health care for the overwhelming majority of the American people. Will you pay more in taxes? Yes, but it will be far less than what you are paying now for a dysfunctional, complicated, wasteful, want to move to Medicare for all. Why is there so much opposition? Where does the opposition come from? And this is the crisis, not only in healthcare, but in many other areas that we face as a nation. Doesn't matter what the American people want, what matters in Washington is what wealthy and powerful corporate interests want. So right now, you got the healthcare industry 
made a hundred billion dollars in profit. If they spent, and they likely will, one percent, one percent of their profits in fighting Medicare for all, meaning 30 second ads and full page advertisements in your newspaper and in the magazines you read. One percent of a hundred billion is a billion dollars. That is what we are up against. Over the last 20 years, the healthcare industry has spent over four billion dollars on lobbyists and campaign contributors campaign contributions to Republicans and Democrats. They own the United States Congress. And what we are telling him, them is that we are sick and tired of a system which is killing people, which is taking money out of hardworking, working class people who cannot afford the high cost of health care. We're sick and tired of paying the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. We want a healthcare system designed to provide quality healthcare to every man, woman, and child in this country, not to make outrageous profits, profits for the insurance companies and the drug companies. That is what this fight is. industry, we're talking about virtually every other issue. I don't have to, and I don't want to, because it's really quite painful, and I don't want to bring you all through this again. We have all seen what happened in El Paso. We have seen what happened in Dayton. We have seen what has happened in schools throughout this country, and what has happened is unspeakable. It is unimaginable, and it's hard to believe that we're becoming numb to the impact of some deranged person walking into a room with an assault weapon and killing people right and left. It's, it's painful and I don't even want to talk about it because it's so disgusting. All right? But the bottom line here is that the American people in urban America and in rural America, gun owners and non-gun owners, and I know in New Hampshire and Vermont we got a lot of gun owners, but people all over this country now know that we need to do something something to address the horror of gun violence that we have seen over the last many years. Does anybody have a magical solution? The answer is no. Nobody does. But what things we can do are common sense and are supported by the vast majority of the people. We need to expand background checks to make sure to make sure that people who should not own guns, do not own guns. We need to do away with the gun show loopholes, which allow people to legally buy guns without undergoing a background check. We need to do away with the so-called straw man provision, which allows somebody to walk into a gun shop, legally buy a dozen guns, and then sell those guns to a criminal element and the gangs, and so forth. In my view, and this has been my view for 30 years, Assault weapons, semi-automatic weapons, are weapons of war. They are designed to kill people as quickly as possible. In my view, we should not be having the sale and distribution of assault weapons in this country. of this on the children of America and the fear 
that they are dealing with every single day. That should not be happening. So I don't have any magical answers, and I can't promise you to snap my finger and end all this stuff. But what I can tell you is that we have got to do everything that we can to end this horrific level of gun violence in America. That is the view of the American people. There are disagreements, but what I just described to you is supported by the majority of the American people. So you might ask, if this is what the American people want, why is Congress not dealing with it? Specifically, why is the United States Senate not dealing with this issue? And the answer is one word, or maybe three words. It's called the NRA. for the United States Congress, for Mitch McConnell, for the Republican leadership, to have the guts to bring common sense gun, se gun safety legislation to the floor of the Senate, let us make that happen. often ask the media says that, well, what is the most important issue? I don't know what the most important issue. All of these issues, decent wages, health care for all, uh, dealing with gun violence, all of these are important issues. But I'll tell you another issue that we can no longer afford to push under the rug. And despite what the President of the United States says, tragically and dangerously, Climate change is not a hoax. Climate change is already causing devastating harm in this country and countries all over the world. And what the scientists tell us in almost a unanimous voice is that we do not get our act together boldly and aggressively that within the next 12 years there will be irreparable harm done in our country and around the world. But once again, once again you have a situation where every day more and more Americans understand the danger of climate change. They are seeing it with their own eyes. They're seeing it with flooding and droughts and extreme weather disturbances in this country. Understanding that just July was the warmest month on record. Looking at what's going on in Europe with unprecedented heat waves in France, the UK, and other countries. Understanding that we're looking, according to the CIA and the Department of Defense, potential of mass migrations of people from one area to another because they can't find drinking water or they can't find ground that they can grow their crops on. We got an international crisis on our hands. And why aren't we dealing with this? Well, I'll tell you once again why. Because it has to do with the power of corporate entities, in this case, the fossil fuel industry. And what we said, and I speak as the father of four and the grandfather of seven, I have determined, as I know you all, to do everything we can to make sure the planet we leave our children and our grandchildren is a planet that is healthy and is habitable. to 
destroy this planet for their short-term profits. The message of our campaign, and those are just some of the issues that are out there. I want to take your comments and your questions. The message of our campaign is us, not me. And that is a, not just a bumper sticker, although it probably will be a bumper sticker, but it is a profound message for two reasons. Number one, there are some people who think the function of life, and this is what Trump means, function of life is to make as much money as you possibly can, and you step on people all over the way, you cheat, you lie, you steal, you do what you can do. And then if you make the billions, you are a great success in life. That's one way of looking at human life. There's another way that says a more civilized and better society is one in which my family has to care about your family and your family has to care about my family and we are in this together. or anybody else can do it alone. I'm not here to say, vote for me and I'm gonna solve all of these problems. You don't worry about it. Send me to Washington, send me to the White House, and I'm gonna do it all. You don't have to worry about it. That is exactly what I am not saying. And the reason for that is that we have got to ask ourselves, how does it happen? After all of the great speeches we have heard for 40 or 50 years, after all of the great party platforms, after all of the legislation passed, how does it happen that the average American worker today, despite huge increases in technology and productivity, is not earning one nickel more than he or she did 45 years ago? How does it happen that over the last 30 years, the top 1% have seen a $21 trillion increase in their wealth? while the bottom half of American society has seen a $900 billion decline in their wealth. How does it happen that today three people in America, three people, own more wealth than the bottom half of American society? And 50% of our people are living paycheck to paycheck, scared to death that if somebody in the family gets sick, they don't know what they can do about it. Scared to death that if their car breaks down, not going to be able to get to work, can't get to work, you don't have any income, don't have any income, can't take care of your kids. That's the reality of economics in America today. And the reason for that is not because everybody in Washington is stupid or ugly or on the tape. The reason for that, the reason for that is you have a corporate power system in which these large, powerful corporations and the 1% exercise unbelievable power over the economic and political life of this country. If we are going to pass Medicare for all, there ain't no easy way around it. We're gonna have to stand up to the drug companies, we're gonna have to stand up to the insurance companies,
And I have been looking for Washington Post, which is owned by the wealthiest guy in this country, guy named Jeff Bezos. We fought with the workers in Amazon to get them 15 bucks an hour. We have pointed out over and over again that Amazon made $10 billion in profit last year. You know how much they paid in taxes? You're not at zero. And you wonder why the Washington Post is not one of my great supporters. I wonder why. New York Times, not much better. All right, but that's what we're up against. We knew it when we got into it. We're taking on them all. Because I'll tell you this, I thought long and hard, Jane and I thought long and hard about whether we should run. Because you know, when you're running in a presidential campaign, my God, there's a lot of ugliness out there. And you know, you tax on your family and everything else. All right, we knew that. But we decided to run for two reasons, which I believe true then and I believe now. Number one, we are the strongest campaign to be able to defeat Donald Trump. Over the last year, over the last year, I don't know how many dozens of polls there have been out there, polls and polls, like with a grain of salt. But you look at all of the polls done over the last year. In every single poll, we have defeated Donald Trump nationally. Just the other day, by eight points on a poll. But that's only one of the reasons. It's not just about being Trump. It is about transforming this country and creating an economy and a government that finally works for all of us, not just the one percent. You have six banks on Wall Street that have assets of 50% of the GDP of the United States, over $10 trillion. How do you stand up to these banks? How do you stand up to the insurance companies and the drug companies and the fossil fuel industry? The only way that change has ever, real change, has ever taken place, it's not from the top on down, it's from the bottom on up. the history of the civil rights movement, the history of the trade union movement, the history of the women's movement, the history of the gay movement, the history of the environmental movement. That's how change takes place. And right now, in this unprecedented moment in American history, we need to bring our people together all across this country to tell corporate America that this country belongs to all of us, not just the few. Anybody have any questions? I see a woman way in the back. Let's go. Do we have a mic? All right, let's get a mic. Zoom that woman in the. Uh... Hi. Hi. I voted for you in the 2016 election, but I have a new concern. Many of your critics are using your self declared label, Democratic Socialist, against you. And I'm confident that if you're the Democratic nominee, the Trump administration will be relentless in its attacks on you, using fear tactics to warn people not to vote for a socialist. You have so much in common with Elizabeth Warren, who has called herself a capitalist. If you win the nomination, how will you convince the public that in many respects we already have a socialist system? And why should we vote for you over Warren? Okay. Well, I don't know. Elizabeth is a friend of mine. If you would make that decision yourself. All I will tell you is you're right. We have a socialist society right now. We give hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks and subsidies 
to the fossil fuel industry, to the pharmaceutical industry, to industry after industry all over this country. That is called corporate welfare. So I happen to believe in democratic socialism for working people, not large profitable corporations. And let's talk about, let's talk about what we mean. I don't want to get anyone too nervous here. But when we talk about democratic socialism, what do you think social security is? What do you think Medicare is, the most popular health insurance? What do you think your public library is? What do you think your police department is? Now look around the world. The ideas that I am talking about, and you're right, Trump will attack me, but you know what, he'll attack, he lies all of the time. He'll attack anybody, he'll attack the most conservative Democrats and socialists. But let's look, let's talk about where we are and where we want to go. In countries around the world, you have quality, affordable, universal childcare. I want that. Is that socialist? I don't think so. In this country, I want to do what every other major country does on earth, provide health care to all people as a right. Throughout the rest of the world, when you have a baby, in Norway, for example, you get virtually an entire year off in parental leave. Woman does, and the husband gets time off as well. You want to call that socialism? Yes. So I think that what you can call it, whatever you want, you call it social democracy, which exists throughout Europe. So I, when I talk about democratic socialism, it means two things. Number one, having the guts to finally take on the corporate elite, which we call it. It means unabashedly, unabashedly and without any apologies, standing with the working class of this country, which has been ripped off year after year, decade after decade. And the ideas that I am talking about, whether it's education, whether it's health care, whether it is ending, this grotesque level of income and wealth inequality, you can call it whatever you want. That's what I believe, and you know what? The vast majority of the American people believe that too. Okay, okay question right there. Sam, yep. You wait for the mic. Bernie, I'm actually going to change up the question that I had for you because of something you said. Okay. I would have wanted to ask you what you would do, but now, because of what you have said to us and what I truly believe, I'm going to ask you what we can do. There, in my life now, I am surrounded by just hate everywhere and anger, and it's really hard to talk to other people with differing points of view and to build bridges. So my question to you is how can we do that? How can we start building unity again in this country with that idiot in the White House? Breaking us apart. And I have a follow-up question. Well, that's a good enough question at this level. Alright, look, you're right. You know, I have Republican friends well, honest people who I disagree with. They're not racist, they're not sexist, they're not xenophobes, they don't propagate hatred. They're conservatives. It's not a crime to be a conservative. And we work together. And by the way, I'm happy to tell you that just recently I worked with one of the most conservative members of the United States Senate, a guy named Mike Lee from Utah. And Mike and I worked together to successfully pass a resolution to get the U.S. out of the Saudi-led intervention in the U.S. And as the former chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs, something that I feel very strongly about. And that when people put their lives on the line to defend this country, we provide them with all of the benefits that they have earned. But what I have done in that regard, it's worked with the late John McCain. John and I worked together to pass, you know, probably the most comprehensive veterans bill passed in recent years. It wasn't perfect, I wasn't happy with the results. All that much, no was John. 
but that's what we did. We worked together. But to answer your question, I think the best way forward is to understand that while there is a lot of hatred, and that should bother us all, we should be able to have civil discourse. You disagree with me, that's fine. You don't have to hate me. Or I don't have to hate you. But at the end of the day, I think what we can understand is that more of the American people are in agreement on issue after issue than you would think. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, you understand that we have a health care crisis and you don't throw 32 million people off the health care they have, which is what Trump attempted to do. Whether you are a Republican or a Democrat, you understand we need a strong educational system. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you understand that climate change is a massive threat to our country and the rest of the world. So I think there is more common ground than people understand. And our job, unlike Trump, is not to foment hatred and division, but to bring people together. And when we disagree, we can disagree. It's called democracy. Nothing to be ashamed about that. But that's kind of what I do. Washington Schultz, what happened four years ago in the primaries, for instance, and this slanted 
kind of rigging, uh, like going into examples, but you know it. If anybody, we all know what is happening in terms of uh, that crapola. And then secondly, um, socialized medicine, socialized education is not a new thing, totally awesome, totally for it. You can still maintain a competitive capitalist model, you know, that's not socialism, period. Anyway, but does it, would it help to bring up New Deal economics from FDR and the social programs, you know, social security reform. All right, thank you. Great, it's a good question. We do, we do talk about it. Okay. Um, number one, in terms of the DNC, Democratic National Committee, I don't want to get into 2016 too much because we're in 2020 right now. We've got to give rise to the future. But last time around, as some of you will remember, before the first popular vote was cast in Iowa, and then a week later here in New Hampshire, my opponent had 500 votes locked up from superdelegates. Remember that? That does not sound to me like a very fair process when one person, before the first popular vote is cast, already has 500 votes locked up. And I'm happy to tell you, as a result of a lot of work done by our people and people all over this country, we have not gone as far as I would want but at least on the first ballot, no superdelegate will be casting a ballot. Oh, yeah. um, I'm sorry, the second one, the second? Oh, right, FDR, right, all right, good. All right, we gave a speech on this, so let me summarize it. In my view, FDR was clearly one of the great presidents in American history. And he helped take the country out of the worst economic depression in our history, and also, you know, defeat Nazism and fascism during World War II. One of the things, and I would urge people to go to YouTube and find this, there was a speech that Roosevelt gave in 1944. It was a State of the Union speech. Didn't get a whole lot of publicity, because he was dead a year later, and that was kind of the end of World War II, and people were, you know, preoccupied with the war. But this is what he said, in essence, I'm paraphrasing it. He said, you know, in our country, we have a constitution and we have a Bill of Rights, which protects our political freedoms, which is enormously important. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, you know, the whole Bill of Rights, the constitution. But he said, you know what? We do not have, and what we need is an economic bill of rights. Yeah. All right? An economic bill of rights. And in a sense, that is exactly what this campaign is about. We have freedom of speech based on our Constitution. We should guarantee health care to all people as a human right as well. We have freedom of assembly. We should guarantee that every American able to work gets a decent job at decent pay. We have freedom of religion. We should also make sure that we have freedom and the right to get all of the education that we need regardless of our income. So to answer your question, that's exactly what this campaign is about. And that is incorporating economic rights is human rights. We are the wealthiest country in the history of the world. We're not a poor country. We can do these things. We can make sure that all of our kids, from pre-K to graduate school, get a quality education regardless of their income. We can do that. <laughs> Not radical idea. All right, gentlemen right here. All right, my name is Stephen Steiner. Stephen? serve on the Budget Committee, CBA, and Planning Board, and ran for the State Senate. I am a Republican, and I do support Donald Trump. A couple of things. No, no hate here, please. No hate but give me my time. A couple of things. How do you feel about the right to try with Donald Trump? Uh, right to what? Right to try. Right to try. Right to try. Well, no president is above the law. And if, if you talk about that, please. No, 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 no. Right to try, folks is when people are terminally ill, they can get oh, the that are, that, are, that are in the pipeline, they can try, it doesn't matter how uh, far they are. Do experimental drugs? Yes, yeah. right to try. Yeah, in general, I mean, 
Do you have these in general? Yes. Okay, hold on. Sure. Okay, um, the opiate problem hit my family more than once. Uh, when Donald Trump uh, was in Londonderry, the day before the primary in 2016, I got to not ask him a question, or gave him a directive, and that was to uh, ask him to use his family, himself, use the bully pulpit of the White House to do something about the opiate problem. And now using his wife. Because last time this happened was during Ronald Reagan as we wrote him. How do you think he's handling the opiate situation? Well, not well enough, because it is a major epidemic, a major, a major serious problem in your state. It's a serious problem in my state. And I'll tell you what I think. Right now, as you may be aware, there are uh, attorney generals, are you aware of this, from all over the country, have come together uh, to put on trial the major opioid manufacturers. Did you know that? Okay. And one, one of the things that I wanted to do, we wrote to the chairman, I'm on a committee called the Health and Education Committee, which deals with this stuff. And we said, Mr. Chairman, bring the opioid manufacturers into Washington, let them raise their hand under oath, and tell us when they knew that opioids were addictive. Okay, and you know what? I think, I think this trial is gonna show that Purdue and some other major manufacturers knew that it was addictive, and yet they continue, continue. Okay, what? Okay, are you listening, sir? You asked me a question, and I'm talking to you, okay? Okay. Okay. And they knew what they were doing was addictive and dangerous. To my mind, if that in fact is true, they should be tried in a criminal basis. Well, died in 2001, the, the, no one knew about the dangers of how bad Oxycontin was. They only knew, the drug peddlers and all knew how high you could get off by washing off the outer coat and snorting Oxycontin. Okay? So, but uh, there was a point. But there, was, they made the medicine for sick people. And, oh, and they they the I do know a little bit about this. I'm on the committee. I mean, there was a point. I think in the beginning, you're right, it was made, made to deal with severe pain, and it does that. But there was a point when they knew that there were communities in West Virginia and Ohio where an enormous number of pills were coming in which had nothing to do with pain relief. They knew it. And if they knew it and they were passing around those pills, they should be held criminally responsible. how my son ended up now. I, I'm sorry for your loss. Now, yep. just fast forward to, to uh, just another tragedy. My <laughs> <laughs> so you have had two questions. More than anybody else. You have one. Thank you very much. Okay, other questions. Okay. Well, a woman over there. Yes, ma'am. Never mind. Thanks. Um, I'm going to speak to the other side of that just a little bit. Okay. Um, I am an advocate for disability and migraine disability. Yep. I have been a component of socialized medicine since I was a teenager, and I am pushing 50. Here's my other thing that needs to go along with socialized medicine. The decisions need to be made between the doctor and the patient. I hear anecdotally from so many other pain sufferers how they just get caught. We have a friend of our family who was a stage four pancreatic cancer. She went into her to a hospitalization before hospice because they said a stage four pancreatic cancer person who's going to die from health I have to fight with my health insurance company every six months for them to cover a really small amount of pain medication. Somebody in the government or somebody who doesn't have a medical degree should not be making those decisions. Sure. That should be treated. That's where it is. And what she has said, in some degree with the gentleman, is look, opioids are used to deal with severe pain, and they work. What we have seen recently is opioids being used for other reasons. So I don't think it's that hard to do two things. 
We're going to crack down on those people who are selling opioids and getting people addicted. But that does not mean to say that people who have severe pain with their doctor's you know, approval can use opioids. That's not a complicated issue. So, I, I, I think that's the answer, man. We can do both. Okay, let me get one or two more questions, ma'am, right here. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Sanders. Um, two things. Um, my name is Geraldine Russo, and um, I had a family member die in Sandy Hook, an educator, Lauren Russo. I can't believe it's taken so long. I, every time something happens, it br brings it all back. Now, the NRA is very powerful, and really, it's all about the money and why all the congressmen and all, all the government people. What is your plan for trying to get the gun control passed so that this doesn't happen again? Also, I've been listening to um, all of your Medicare for All, and I agree with it. <clears throat> I've lived in Canada, and um, I'm just wondering how you propose to get the healthcare industry, um, which is another big lobby group, to buy into your Medicare for All, because I really believe it should happen for everyone. Thank you. They're not going to buy into it. I mean, this is what I meant earlier. They made $100 billion last year. They're not going to buy into this. They have to be defeated. Now you need to move away from a healthcare system designed to make billions of profit for them to a Medicare for all nonprofit system. So we're not going to buy into it. We have to take them on and defeat them. All right, in terms of, look, in terms of the NRA, and I'm sorry for your loss, sorry for your loss, we have people here with loss, relatives, should not have been killed, died. And, you know, Taking on the NRA is a political issue, and I want to say this. We are, in fact, winning the struggle, not as fast as I want. Now, Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, refuses to bring up gun safety legislation. But he is now on the defensive, as is the NRA. What we saw after Parkland, remember Parkland in Florida? We saw these kids who had experienced a tragedy that is unbelievable that any child has to go through. And they stood up and they fought back, they got young people all across this country involved in the political process, and they had some real success in electing people who understood the need for gun safety legislation. So we have got to put as much pressure as we can on Mitch McConnell, and the message is very simple. Listen to the American people, not just the NRA. And if he does that, he's going to pass the game. Okay, last question. Man. Yo, last okay. question. Okay, hi. Oh, is it okay. you or me? Just, just, just. Hi. Yeah. Hi, I'm hi. Hello. I just moved here two years ago from the suburb of Philadelphia. Uh, Ryan Costello's old district. Um, I'm a new brother, I feel like our family's only hope. Um, we have two autistic children, um, we incurred $200,000 in medical debt, and had to go into bankruptcy, because they're therapy from a couple. So in order to cover your autistic kids, you went $200,000 in debt, you went into bankruptcy. Yes, yes. Um, in 2013, I'm not, I was an operating nurse in North Philadelphia, at a local trauma center. And uh, during the Obama said I got an injury and lost my career and lost my home and lost my car. We, still, we came up here to New Hampshire for a brand new life, which I believe that we're going to get. Um, but the biggest thing people need to know about healthcare is being working in the hospital. I saw the people who had no healthcare, who they were really, really sick, almost dead, come through the ER, and then they could get covered because it's an emergency. That's the deal, you can't bring them away. But the ones that were the worst were the ones who were too embarrassed to come to the ER. And some of those patients became organ donors because they got so sick 
from a tiny infection that they were too ashamed to go to the ER. What they did was they just let it go until it was too bad and too late. Something, this is a critical issue. What can we do to make people see a different perspective? Healthcare for all has to be done. I, I want to tell you, and I wish I could tell you what's happening in class, but as I mentioned earlier, poll after poll now shows the American people do support Medicare for all. Okay? And your point is not only did your family go bankrupt, but as a nurse, you saw people who died because they didn't get to the hospital and to the doctor when they should. And by the way, when you go to the emergency room, as you know, that's the most expensive form of primary health care that's out there. Right? So what we are doing, and what we're trying to do here, is pass legislation that makes health care all right. That means you go to the doctor when you want to go. You know, in Canada, people don't appreciate this. I was up in Toronto two years ago, I think it was. Went into a hospital, very nice. In Canada, if you have major surgery, and you're in the hospital for a month or three weeks, you know what your bill is when you leave? Zero, and they spend 50% less than we do per person on health care. You go to any doctor you want, you go to any hospital that you want, because the function of their system is to provide health care to all, not to make 100 billion in profits for the health care industry. So I think Medicare for All would address the issues that you are talking about in terms of opening the doors to everybody and in terms of preventing bankruptcies. All right, let me, let me just conclude by thanking everybody for coming out on this rather long evening here. We need your help to win here in New Hampshire. Let's go for the